Welcome to the Indigo Podcast, an exploration of human flourishing at work and beyond. I'm Ben Barron of Indigo Anchor and Cleveland State University. And I'm Chris Everett of Indigo Anchor. For more information, please visit us at www.indigopodcast.com. All right, so today on the podcast, we have Rob Breener, and we're going to talk about evidence-based practice, which That's right. is different than evidence-based management. And we're going to yeah. get into that. But um, Ben, what are we going to talk about today? Yeah. So evidence-based practice is generally this uh, overall umbrella term with with other types of evidence-based uh, things underneath it. And we're going to talk about what it is. We're going to talk about what it is not. And we're going to talk about why it's difficult, some of the barriers. And we're going to talk about some of the ways in which you can get started with evidence-based practice. And let me properly introduce Rob Reiner. He is a professor of organizational psychology at Queen Mary University of London and also co-founder and scientific director of the Center for Evidence-Based Management. He has received several awards for his work in this area, including the British Psychological Society Division of Occupational Psychology Academic Contribution to Practice Award in 2014 and topped HR Magazine's Most Influential Thinker list in 2016. And uh, I could go on and on about Rob's accomplishments and his accolades, uh, but just uh, want to give you a warm welcome, Rob Reiner, to the Indigo Podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ben. And Chris, thank you. Excellent. Yeah. This this is huge. So if you guys don't know who Rob Breener is, you need to go fix yourself and get on the Internet. OK, that's right. That's, that's right. Step, step one. All right. Well, and, and, you know, legitimately, when we first started this podcast about a year ago, I, I mentioned Rob to uh, to Chris and said, we got to get him on someday when we're ready to start having guests. And uh, so it's been great uh, doing that. And it's great to have him on. So maybe we can start just with a kind of a broad overview, Rob, and Tell us, you know, what is evidence-based practice, what it is not? How did you get into all of this? Yeah, well, I'll talk about how I got into it first. So about 25, 30 years ago, lost in the midst of time when I was doing my PhD, I was actually doing it at a place uh, where there were not only organizational psychologists, because that's my background, there were also clinical psychologists. And a very close colleague there, I was doing some actually organizational psychology work with. She was a clinical psychologist, and we were both quite interested in evidence. And she said to me, so have you heard of evidence-based practice? I said, not, no, not at all. Uh, and so she basically introduced me to it. And the reason she knew about it is she's from a different background in psychology, clinical psychology. So it's kind of news to me, as it is news to most organizational psychologists as well. So from that point on, I just thought, well, this is quite a kind of interesting way of thinking about how practitioners can make better quality, better informed decisions. Now, there's all kinds of things wrong with the term. So the word evidence is already pretty loaded and people people immediately jump to conclusions about what that means. Also, base sounds like, you know, you're only going to do things if there's a certain kind of evidence to do it. And it, it's a, in that sense, it is quite a misleading term. So I got into it from that point. And what it really means or what it's for, so talk about what it's for, is just to help people in practice make more informed decisions both more informed about what are the problems or opportunities they face in their work, whatever that work is, and also what are the most likely solutions or interventions to meet those problems or opportunities. So it's just a way of helping you do it a bit better. So on that level, it sounds like you know a famous no-brainer. Well, of course you're going to do that. Of course you are. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so everybody thinks they're going to do it. Everyone thinks they can do it. And this is where it, gets, it slightly gets away from common sense in a way in that the kind of formal definition of what it is really it's about using multiple sources of evidence so not just one or two but maybe three or four or five or whatever and it's doing it in a critical way and it's using it say both to identify what the issue is and also to identify potential solutions so although it's kind of yeah everybody makes everybody's evidence sure everyone does that yeah sure uh it's not quite the same thing as evidence-based practice it's slightly different yeah, so let's let's contrast that with evidence based management. I sure. mean, they overlap, but they're, they're kind of different. Yeah, so I would, I would say evidence based practice is simply trying to do evidence based practice in the field of management. Uh, so it's a sort of the same thing, uh, but it's just simply applying it in a particular field. So I think there's some important differences. So if you just take management, everybody always uses evidence. You won't find a manager anywhere who doesn't use evidence of some kind. So, yeah, what's the contrast? What's the difference between evidence-based management and what managers normally do? And I'll say other people like HR managers, organizational psychologists, other kinds of practitioners normally do. 
So the first difference, and this again sounds a bit weird, it's about the approach to the use of evidence. So typically people talk about, in well-known definitions, conscientious, explicit, judicious. So conscientious obviously means you really try. Uh, explicit means you write it down, you share it. You don't just say, I know this won't work, or <laughs> I saw this research that shows, no, hold on, what did you actually see? We all need to be able to see that and share it. So conscientious, explicit, and a key part of it is judicious. So making judgments about the quality of evidence. Now, even that alone is something that people, in my experience, often don't do. They will tend to say, let's make a decision based on evidence, and they pour everything in, throw it all in the mix, and say, there we go, we've done it. However, what people also realise is a lot of evidence is just unreliable, it's untrustworthy, it's misleading. So you don't look at all the evidence, you look at the best available evidence, otherwise it's going to be quite misleading. So I would say the first general difference is the idea of this approach, conscientious, explicit and judicious. The second difference, I think, is multiple sources. So again, different practitioners, different managers, different professionals have their own sort of favourite source of evidence. So for some academics, for example, and some practitioners, they might say, well, my go-to source of evidence is the academic literature, the scientific literature, the latest meta-analysis, that's my source of evidence. Whereas a manager might say, well, my source of evidence is actually going to talk to people. I'm going to find out what my stakeholders think. And pe other people, like data analytics people, might look at organisational data. So all those things are fine, but on their own, they're not enough. So the second key difference then is this idea of looking across multiple sources. Uh, one of my favourite analogies, or I think it works up to a point, it doesn't work so much during COVID-19, is the idea, for example, of choosing a restaurant. So you arrive at a city you've never been at before, you want to get a really good dinner, you know nothing about the place, you know, you, you have, you're have going to get some information, some evidence, some data. Now, you could just go to a guide, and that, that might help. You could ask a concierge, that might help, but they're biased, guides are biased. You could ask somebody you meet on the street. Well, okay, maybe they'll know. You could go look at which restaurant's got the biggest queue. That tells you something, but maybe not so much. So the idea of looking across these multiple sources kind of makes sense. And if you did that in choosing a restaurant in the city you've never been to before, and you treated the evidence critically, the information critically, the chances are, when you made your decision, you will get a better dinner. Does it guarantee it? No. But I think it emphasises the idea why multiple sources are potentially important, where each source is telling you something, they all have their limitations, so that kind of sense of triangulation is pretty important. So that's the second thing, multiple sources. The third difference, this is quite long, I apologise, the third difference... No, our, is... our listeners eat this stuff up, so don't, don't okay. shorten <laughs> Don't yourself. hold back, Rob. <laughs> uh, okay, thank you very much. The third difference uh, is a structured or stepped approach. So you ask a question, you acquire the evidence, you critically appraise it, you apply it, and then you assess the outcome. So you follow a set of stages. Now, again, as we know generally when it comes to decision-making, we all tend to resist structured decision-making. We all tend to go, yeah, yeah, we can make the decision. Let's just sit around, have a chat, make a decision. Yeah, that's fine for some things, but actually it's not very helpful where, say, the outcome of the decision is going to be really important or where potentially it's going to cost a lot of money or where it's going to affect people's lives, where it's going to determine the success of your organisation. So I think in those contexts, taking a stepped approach is important because we're easily pushed off course by all kinds of things, our own biases, politics, all kinds of stuff, just the urge to get there and get on with the decision. And all these things get in the way. So taking a stepped approach is, I would say, the third main difference that sets it apart from the way managers, many of us, normally use evidence in our decision making. Yeah, you know, and one thing that comes to mind is that one thing that, and we talked about this when we were doing some preparation for this episode, mm. is that oftentimes when we think about leadership, we think about things like being decisive or knowing the right thing to yeah. do. And I feel like that oftentimes that can bias us against the approach that you just mentioned. That's right. And I think decisive is often tied up with, with speed. Uh, yes. And one of these issues is about making people feel they should make decisions quickly. And it's somehow impressive if you make a decision quickly. And yes, sure, in some circumstances, it might be if you're a highly skilled technician of some particular kind of practice. Uh, great. You know, you might be a great, uh, I know you're improvising, you're a musician or you're a sports person and everything there is quite sort of intuitive and learnt over thousands of hours of practice. The problem for, uh, I think, managers and decision makers in these kinds of contexts is they are not 
they haven't practiced this a thousand times over a thousand right you know they haven't got that kind of expertise it's different and i think there's a huge danger in seeing the skill of a senior decision maker being decisive a bit like the skill of another practitioner but it's not the same as you know to develop that kind of expertise you know you need various kind of conditions you need to firstly have say done it that the same kind of thing thousands of times like playing an instrument or cooking a meal or playing a sport you practice 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 the second thing is you have lots of feedback so you know really quickly whether that decision was good or not you know you hit a string on a guitar you kind of know whether you've missed it hit it it's in tune it's out of tune now for senior decision makers they just don't have that they don't have that practice. They don't have that accurate feedback. And thirdly, what they don't have is a stable environment. So you do a relatively stable environment, like on a plane with a ball, on a sports field or something, whatever it is, so you can practice and practice and practice. And the conditions are relatively similar. So, yeah, so being decisive, making decisions fast makes sense in some contexts, I think, for some kinds of expertise, but not, I think, for complex decisions that, say, you know, leaders, decision makers would make. Though you're right, it is seen as a great attribute, you know, they're so decisive, they make decisions fast. And in fact, sometimes people say, you know, the problem with evidence-based practice is it slows us all down, to which my response is normally great, good. That's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. <laughs> you know. Yeah, you, if you're going to go off a cliff, gosh, let's go really slow. <laughs> yeah. Let's not just speed on over it, Thelma and Louise it. style. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah, you know, so uh, I just want to point our listeners to a great article that you wrote in the winter 2019 issue of People and Strategy in which you break down and I think do a really good job of explaining what evidence-based practice is. And you talk about the the three key differences uh, that you just mentioned with regard to how people normally see evidence and what evidence-based uh, practice or evidence-based management is about. Mm. Um and, you know, I'll put a link to that in the show notes so people can check it out. Uh, I just want to review for folks. You mentioned these four sources of, yeah. of evidence. What, so go through those really quickly for our Yeah, folks. so I think I mentioned, I mean, the sort of analogy of choosing a restaurant, I mentioned things like, you know, concierge, a guidebook, Google reviews. And, you know, those of you with experience of TripAdvisor will know that in many ways it's hugely unreliable. We know why, because you can pay organizations to put up good reviews of your place and bad reviews of the people's. And yeah, stuff. Where, so, where do we pay those guys? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's why our review, yeah, the reviews on this podcast are through the roof because we just been well, paying folks. But we can only afford 12 of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe it's worth investing, you know. When, you know <laughs> people haven't right. caught on yet to the unreliability of those data. But yeah, but things like TripAdvisor and, and, you know, and other sources are more or less reliable. But the point is you, you still might look at them. And I think in an organizational context, so for a manager, an IO psychologist, an HR person, you know, what have they got? What have they got? Well, the first thing they've got is their own experience as a practitioner. Now, like any source of evidence, that might be really valid and useful. Or it may be pretty unreliable and untrustworthy, but it's still very important, partly because it could be useful. And the other reason is if you don't look at it, that's going to be biasing you. You might believe very strongly, for example, that employee engagement is really strongly linked to performance. You just believe that and you've always believed that. Well, good for you, but you know you need to explore why you think that. And if you've only say worked in one organisation or done an engagement survey once, or you've never really looked at data, we might conclude you believe that fine, but actually it's not a very reliable belief because it was what it's actually based on. But and nonetheless, it might be very valuable as well. So the first one, in no particular order, is your experience as a practitioner. Uh, the second source will be typically management and HR, the, your organisational data. So what's going on internally? Uh, what do you know from sales figures or performance figures or employee behavior? What's going on in your organization? You can try and track and analyze in different ways to understand what the issues might be and also what you can do about it. The third source would be stakeholders. So again, for a manager, that would might be uh, customers, clients, employees, partners, whoever it happens to be. What do they think about what's going on? That's a source of information too. You know, what, what are their values around this? What do they think is is going on? Uh, what do they think might be a problem? So stakeholders is a very important source as well. And the fourth source is scientific evidence. Uh, and again, you know, what does scientific evidence suggest are the problems or issues? And what does scientific evidence suggest the best available evidence suggests are the potential solutions? So the, and there may, there may be other sources too, but they're just examples of kind of the four main sources, certainly in our domain, you might look at. And in the context, say, so this originated in medicine, 
uh, evidence-based practice. So in that context, it will be you know taking account of what the patient wants, for example, their family. It might be looking at the scientific evidence around that medical problem, but also as a medical practitioner, looking at your and your team's expertise. It's kind of partly borrowing from that. Yeah, so they're, they're, they're the four main sources, I think, in evidence-based management, yeah. Yeah, that's great. You know, one thing that uh, we talked about when we were preparing for this episode is uh, how those of us in the world of organizational psychology, yeah. um, there's kind of a bias or an understanding, oh yeah, we know what this is. We That's know right. what evidence-based yes. practice is about. And and a lot of times, as you already mentioned, it's about, oh, well, we can just look at the scientific literature as this one source. And that's really not what we're talking about here. And I I, I would wonder if you could just speak a little bit to sure. what you see about our field. Yeah. So organizational psychology in particular is an interesting one because I think it's in a lot of the context I psychologists work they are seen as and often sell themselves as the science guys and girls you know they're the people they're the kind of geeks they're the people they're all about science sure they, they may do indeed and that is part of their background and certainly they are psych- indeed geeks they are indeed <laughs> geeks yeah <laughs> both trained to be geeks and attracted for those those kind of geeky reasons and of course being a geek is actually also a source of bias of course because you love this stuff you like cool studies you like cool experiments so you know, just because you like some enthusiastic and expert doesn't mean you're, you're kind of without bias, of course. But one of the issues of organizational psychology is, is we, I think, over the years have developed a number of constructs, and particularly when it comes to practice, a set of techniques, which are almost, uh, you know, God-given. That this is what we do as I, I psychologists. It might be psychometric testing. It might be assessment centers. It might be certain forms of training. The kind of things I psychologists kind of routinely do. But of course, the problem is, well, there's two issues with it. One is quite often we get asked to do this stuff as practitioners when the client has already decided what they want. So the client says, oh, can you run an assessment center? Now, we as good evidence-based organizational psychologists, as good IO psychologists might say, well, we can run an assessment center, but what's the issue? The client's going to say, well, we just are going to do one. Do you want to do it or not? Do you want this work or <laughs> I, not? I need a science rubber stamp on what I'm going to do <laughs> yeah, anyway. I need, I need a, exactly. <laughs> I'm not interested in what the problem is. I'm interested in running an assessment center. Do you want to do it or not? Exactly. You know, you know how to do this stuff. So it's quite a challenge for pra- any practitioner to sort of work in an evidence-based way when your clients or customer just wants the thing. Uh, right. So you often don't have that much power in that relationship because obviously as a practitioner – you need the work, you want the work, and so forth. And that's one issue. And the second issue is, is that quite often we we get yeah, sure there's all kinds of things around validity of assessment centers, and they're problematic in some ways, as you know, they're useful in other ways, as you know, but it's quite nuanced. So even if an assessment center is in principle quite a useful thing to do, there's still a huge amount of tweaking to be done to say, how can we do it here in this context with these people? And to what objectives, for what kind of purpose are we actually doing this? And this is all the kind of le- very important level of detail. I think for IO psychologists, either we don't do very well or we don't get the chance to do because of the way we work and our clients want us to work. As you yeah. said, Chris, you know, bring on the geeks, just get them to do it and get them out. <laughs> and then we've we've done it, we've done our science seal of approval. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. I wonder if there's kind of an attitude of arrogance in the field of social science as it, mm. as it relates to work with regard to executives and people who are actually doing this stuff. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, we talk about the science practice gap. And sometimes I think those of us who maybe are in the, the ivory tower a little bit say, well, it's just about them doing what we have studied. and found Exactly. Yeah. Through. But I think it goes both ways. It absolutely goes both ways. And historically, when I first started getting into evidence-based practice in fields like HR, management, uh, IO psychology, I think I was very much that way inclined. I was like, what is wrong with you people? There's this great meta-analysis. Why aren't you just doing what it says and sort of discounting both those other sources of evidence, which are absolutely crucial. My source of evidence was best because I'm an academic, so mine is the best. Uh, Science is obviously the most reliable. Well, maybe, but other other sources of evidence can be too. So it's partly sort of that arrogance of ours is the strongest, but also I think not having uh, enough sympathy with uh, the criticisms that have been made for many, many years about the quality of the scientific evidence we've got. So things like the replication crisis, things like p-hacking, scientists themselves doing all kinds of stuff to produce what is essentially often quite unreliable data. Like There's lots of it, but it's quite questionable. So I think often we have an ex- we're too confident, I think, as researchers about the quality of the stuff we've got. And because of that, it's probably wrong to foist it onto practitioners, particularly if we don't take enough account of the context in which they're working. 
so yes, yeah, so I think I think I think a lot of people come to this initially, and my understanding is also what happened in medicine. Such, such evidence is all about the science. It's all about the science. You just give people the science and use the science. And yeah, it's part of it, sure. But it's only one part, of it, and you have to be critical, as you would about any other sorts of evidence. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a challenge. I, you know, a lot of mm. the ivory tower guys have never sat on the phone with the CEO crying because it's his fourth month of not really feeding his family well because he's writing a paycheck to his uh, employees. Yeah. Right? And, I, and I think, again, when it goes, so, you know, we're going to talk in a little while about barriers. So what's interesting to me, and again, it's over a long time, I've, I've kind of, I think I've come to this, this view, is that if you look at managers and say, why aren't why you more evidence-based in your practices? You can also look at academics and say, why aren't you more evidence-based in your practices as scientists? Right. And they will say more or less the same things as a manager might say. They will say, I haven't got time. I need to get stuff published. Uh, I will get tenure if I get these kinds of papers in these kinds of journals. Do you want me to do statistical significance? Sure. I know there's all kinds of problems with it, but I'll do it anyway uh, because it's what's going to get me, you know, promoted get me tenure whatever and managers say quite quite a similar thing so again this is where it, it's quite hard to blame any individual for this so for the individual academic they're in a system that's rewarding certain kinds of behaviors and one of the behaviors that is not rewarding is is using higher better quality methods what it's rewarding is doing more or less what everyone else is doing tweaking it a bit filling little minuscule gaps in fairly trivial subjects very often and that's what will get you on. So I think it's hard to blame that individual. And often people know it's not quite right. Similarly, I think managers often know it's quite right, quite right when they're choosing to ignore or not explore bits of that evidence jigsaw because they just want to get on and make a decision. So yeah, yeah absolutely. So I think it happens, it happens to every practitioner, yeah. Sure, yes. yes. Huge gap here, right? And a huge gauntlet. But so listeners, we're going to help you out here, right? Yeah. Because you're saying, <laughs> wait, wait a minute, there's problems in the science? Ah! <laughs> Wait, there's problems in the business environment. Ah! I mean, lions and tigers and bears. Oh my! Yeah, but but let's let's get into it, right? So we're gonna. So we've already highlighted some, but it's it's difficult. So if you're a manager that says, "Hey, Rob, I I buy into this," you know, yeah. okay, there's challenges in the business of literature and stuff, but I'm not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Sure. Well. What barriers am I going to face as an individual that just now learned today what IO Psych is and starting to <laughs> approach this? Right. Okay. So as, as a practitioner, say if you're a manager and you want to start doing evidence-based practice, one thing, so the sense of evidence-based management, which has been going for around 10 years now, one of the things we've found is that the people that approach us are often what we call the lone wolves. These are individuals who, who have got frustrated in their job as a manager in HR, IO psychology, whatever field it is. And they go, why is everyone doing this stuff? Why aren't they looking at the evidence from here or the evidence from here? Why aren't they thinking critically? And it just drives some people nuts. So they approach us and say, I'm trying to make it happen. And one thing I think we've learned about that is as an individual manager, an individual practitioner, it's really difficult. It's really difficult to do this because you might go in with your agenda of trying to make a well-informed decision, taking time, being conscientious, explicit and judicious. But all your colleagues are going, you know what, can we just get on with it um, <laughs> and interestingly even in, you know even, even in my own work if I think about part of my role is to be an educator and as you know the main way in which university students are taught is what's the method that's typically used it's a lecture yep. what do we know by looking at any basic stuff about learning <laughs> lecturing is a terrible way for people to learn <laughs> yet if I say to myself or to my colleague you know what let's just stop doing lectures and the students how will they feel about that? They want lectures. Now, is that just a micro example? It's difficult. I could decide I'm going to stop doing lectures because I believe they're rubbish. Yeah. Now, how will that go down? But they're so efficient for the professor. You don't <laughs> yeah. have to do some multivariate learning with exciting YouTube. That's clips. right. Yeah, yeah. Well, one interesting thing going on now, you, you picked up, I'm sure, it's be going on the States and the UK and probably, you know, in many countries around the world. It's because students are now doing everything or lots of more stuff online. Sure. Some of them have feel, well, why am I paying my fees? Through it's down to as well. Actually, it's now costing more. It's costing more to teach you. Because we're having, to, as you're saying, Chris, to prepare all this online stuff and really think about the pedagogy and think about the way we're teaching. And wait a minute, you, you just know. said professors and thinking about pedagogy. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that's <laughs> a, does that is even that, happen? Is that, 
Okay, <laughs> I think I did see one once, <laughs> but it could no, have been that, in a, it could have been a in a dream. Yeah, this is a challenge. The professors are like, well, I, you know, I got to publish Jack Wagons to get yeah. the, you know tenure to get my thing going because then I'm going to retire and forget all you, you yeah. know, numbskull <laughs> students that don't proofread your papers before you hand them in, all that kind of stuff, right? Sure. And then you got the students to be like, man, I wish. I wish I could just understand what that guy up there was saying. Yeah. Half the stuff that comes out of his mouth, I've got, I'm lost. <laughs> Quite. I, mean, I, I, I paid for an education. He wants to do research and get on with it. Yes. Well, that's, <laughs> and that is, yeah. The, and that, the, that's another challenge as well. I mean, some, particularly in business school context, some academics have talked about, to get around exactly that problem, Chris, is they've talked about the uh, the song and dance routine. So that they might, you might get a business school professor who does his or her research, but when they get into the classroom, they're very aware they've got to be entertaining. Again, this is this is another great little micro example of incentives. So you, we're talking about what can people do to get started and what are some of the barriers. So one of the barriers is incentives. As you know, again, just using an example from my experience, to well, partly because it's it's my experience, and also to say I am no different from other practitioners. You know, university professors are often graded on the popularity of their their lectures. So, yep. what are student ratings? Yeah, now, ratemyprofessor.com and <laughs> is my professor hot yeah. or not? Well, <laughs> there's those kinds of ratings and possibly even as bad from an educational point of view or from an educational point of view, ratings that ask students if they like the course, you know. Right. And what this means is the, the evidence from educational research seems to be that actually not only is there probably no correlation between how much you enjoy the course and how much you learned, the correlation may actually be negative. The causality may be negative. So the more you enjoy it, the less you learn. But because we, as in this case, academics are incentivized to get high scores, we will tend to do the song and dance routine, the entertaining stuff, the fun stuff. So students love us. They love our courses. Okay, they haven't learned anything, but we get really good ratings. But uh, so what I'm saying is this, this kind of stuff is everywhere. So it's not, it's not as though there are some practitioners who are in this kind of great position of being wonderful and evidence-based. These incentives, the, the, what, the demands to work in certain ways get in the way, the kind of barriers. So back to your question, Chris, what can people do to get started? Number one is, you know, don't do it on your own. It won't work. It's too difficult. Yeah. I, I, I'll say to my colleagues, I'll say, let's, stop, let's all stop lecturing. They're going to think I'm insane. So the first thing both, to do both is, can be true. Both can be true. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the, the first thing to do is actually try and learn about what it is and try and see if anyone else is interested. So it could be your colleagues, if you, if you work in a consultancy, or if you're a freelance, you know, professional. Can you team up with other people and say, can we, are you interested in this? Can we try and do this a bit more? So first is trying to work with other people. So I think, I think that's the first way of getting going. And then even if you can't quite do that, I think there's really simple things you can do. It is, it, it, look, sometimes people say, what's the one thing you can do to be a bit more evidence-based? There's one thing. And the one thing you can do is say, what is the problem or issue or opportunity we're actually dealing with? Uh, let's and then stop. assess to make sure that that's the real one. Yeah, let's stop thinking about the solution. So some of the training we do, we sometimes get groups of decision makers together. So right, this morning, we're all going to think about a problem or issue you've got in your organization, think about the evidence you've got, and we can help you maybe look for some of the evidence or look for the scientific evidence. And this afternoon, but only this afternoon, we're going to start thinking about interventions. And you can imagine what happens. Within minutes, people are thinking about solutions. Mm -hmm. So this, and this is to do, I think, with cognitive ease and cognitive effort. I think it's basically easier and it's more fun to think about doing stuff. Let's intervene. Let's have a training program. Let's reorganize. Let's buy this. You know, that's more fun and easier than saying what is actually going on here. So, so I think one, the one thing that make a lot of difference in and of itself is say we need to spend more time thinking about what the problem or issue is, more kind of on that diagnosis bit. Because and it's, it's hard work, right? But in the end, you're more likely to do something that is relevant to the organisation, and you're more likely to do something that's going to work. So I think I think that can make a big difference. Yeah. So I think that's another, another quick thing you can do is to sort of say what is the problem or issue. Yeah. And, you know, when you're talking about going it alone, I think there's uh, I wonder what you think about, you know, aspects of organizational culture or climate mm. that that potentially could play a role in an organization's or a team's uh, ability to move more towards evidence based practice or not. Yeah, I, th I think there's a hell of a lot in that. So I think one of the things is you don't give people incentives like me and my ratings from students. You don't give people incentives to actually take them away from the core 
that you're trying to do in your business or organizations. Yeah. So for example, you don't incentivize people to you know hit a lot of sales targets if your actual long-term objective is to build up long-term sustainable relationships with customers. Because what they will do is hit those targets, but probably end up you know not delivering, developing bad relationships, and they're not building up long-term relationships. So I think incentivize people in ways which are consistent with what it is you're trying to do and also I think in terms of things like speed of decision making back to culture and climate those kinds of things is actually saying what what we value around here is not doing stuff it's not how quickly you do stuff it's doing stuff that number one is important to the business organization and you can show it is and doing stuff that's more likely to work we don't care so much if it doesn't work uh, but what we do care is you've gone through a process you can show you're working you can show us that you have followed a process and left some kind of audit trail the way you made a decision. So I think that's a kind of cultural climate. Uh, that I think you maybe do get in some kinds of organisations, like high reliability organisations, like perhaps the military, where things can really go wrong. People pay much more attention to the ways in which they made a decision because they know that that could be questioned later. And also, it's very hard to learn if you don't do that. It's very hard to learn. So, yeah, I think there's a few cultural climate things around that that, that could help, yeah. Yeah, so let's let's talk about some broader cultural kind of stuff. So, uh, based on what we're talking about here, yeah. So, is anybody actually doing this? When the rub, it sounds nice. It sounds like a fantasy, yeah. Rob. It is a fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> but are, are some people actually doing this? Well, it's interesting. So, Bob Sutton uh, said in a tweet a while ago. Uh, he, he just said to me, "Rob, isn't this stuff just too hard?" <laughs> as in right you know uh because i think he was thinking or feeling possibly from what i've said i can't quite remember that, that basically the idea of saying that these four sources of these six steps the idea that unless you're doing everything then you're not being evidence-based and of course that's not the case but it can sometimes come across like that so your question chris is is anyone actually doing it i would say lots of organizations are doing some of it uh some organizations are doing other bits. Some organizations completely missed certain parts of it. So I'd say a lot of organizations are doing it to some extent, but not so much because they're following the definition and the model of evidence-based management uh, that, that we put forward at the center of evidence-based management, but more just by accident because they've thought it through and they're kind of doing it. So for example, organizations might use a lot of data analytics. So they may be analysing to death and possibly quite well also the internal data. They may also, for example, be talking to some stakeholders. So they've got two bits of it. They're, they're, it's OK. You know, that's fine. No, they're, they're doing it. But maybe they didn't really think carefully about the problem. Or maybe they, for example, forgot about the meaning of the problem. So the classic example is you do lots of data analytics and you say, wow, we've found out a great way of predicting turnover. We found out if you look at, you know, the number of times people email, how often they're absent, uh, blah, 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 whether they went on this course, if they like their boss, but all together and it predicts turnover, it predicts that people will quit. Then the question is, do we actually have a problem with turnover? No, we don't, but we've <laughs> predicted it. So what was the point of that? So I think there's that issue about what is, what is the problem you're trying to deal with. So even when people do parts of it, they often miss that bit out and they're very good at analysing looking at data. So in terms of specific organisations, I mean, allegedly, uh, Google do this quite well, which you would expect. Uh, my limited understanding is if, if you said, well, can where's the scientific evidence, for example, as one source of data they use, I don't know they would be using that very much. Would they be using their own organisational data and the employees? Sure. And they probably do that, you know, a lot. But where they do the other bits, I'm kind of, I'm not so sure about. So, yeah, I think some organisations are doing bits of it. Uh, but where anyone's doing it a lot, I'm not so sure. And again, this partly comes down to not knowing what it is and isn't. And also comes down to a lot of the barriers that we started discussing about what, what actually gets in the way. Yeah. So I think one, one way of actually trying to judge this is, again, I'm sure you're going to put up in the show notes, looking at the model of evidence-based management, evidence-based practice, looking at those sources, look at things like conscientious, explicit, judicious, look at the six steps. And you're not looking for perfection. You're just saying, how much are people doing this stuff? And that's kind of gives you a judge. And in fact, sometimes when we're doing stuff with teams and trying to develop teams and doing it, we actually say, look, you can use this almost as a checklist. How much of this stuff are you doing? You don't have to do it all. If you do a bit more of it, it'll be a bit better. Like me choosing my restaurant. If I look at two different review sites and that's the conscious, it's probably better than looking at one review site. 
So it's not perfection, it's doing it a little bit more. So yeah, I don't know, organisations have explicitly adopted this. I mean, some tell me they have, and then they say, well, we could tell you about it, but then we'll have to kill you. <laughs> As though they've got some uh, incredible commercial uh, secret or something in this. So there may be some who are doing it, but don't particularly want to talk about it. But I'm, I'm not convinced that, about that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we have to sign non-disclosures with clients as well. Because, listen, if you guys can do this well, it is a secret sauce in your org. Yeah. But now let's let's do a bit of a deeper dive in this evidence-based practice. But I, I just want to say this. Like, you know, there's this illusion that, hey, if we could just hire – you know, 60 yeah. year business veterans into every role, and the junior roles all the way into the CEO's roles that did stints in academia, multi-industry experience, then then we're great, right? Or I want to get somebody off the shelf that can just do this job perfectly. Mm. And anybody who's dealt with large scale enterprise level workforce strategy knows you got to get the junior numbskill talent. Hey man, I just got out four years of college from ready to work, you know? <laughs> uh, I'm here, right? <laughs> and 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 if, you know, better organizations have learning and development partner right. departments, right? And so yeah, and you have a track for your junior manager. I mean, right? We have ways to assess uh, high potential talent and put them on the track to have broadening experiences. It's all of this stuff that goes into making somebody from numbskull to fully operational death star <laughs> right and and so but that's the positive thing about the model you have here rob is that this stuff is a skill that can be learned this isn't Absolutely. some secret you know i found this on a secret papyrus exactly. in the tomb in egypt right exactly this is a skill it's a group skill you've got some of this stuff so let's let's talk through um some of that um if you get this skill, is this about arriving at truth or the right answer? No. <laughs> Great question. So you're absolutely right. It is definitely a skill that we believe people can learn. You're right. So there's no reason why even though know, kids in school can't learn some of these skills. It's not right. a kind of – didn't have to be a genius or a brain act to be able to do this. So, yeah, so you, it is a skill you can learn. And I think – I've now forgotten your question, Chris, which was – like, OK, so we want to do this. So, well, let's, yeah. let's break it up into two parts. Let's talk about kind of how you guys teach this stuff. Right. You've okay. got the. Let's talk about the. Um, yeah. The Center for Evidence Based Management. Yeah, Tell us a little exactly. bit more about what you do there to help yeah. people do this better. Yeah. OK. So the center's developed over a number of years quite a lot of online modules, which you can take to try and give you some of the basic kinds of skills. And also we do some in-company in-house training as well. And also we support and help various universities and business schools actually around the world. And that's probably 70 or 80 who are actually trying to teach this stuff as well. So, yeah, back to your point, Chris, it's very it, – it is eminently teachable. It's not something you need to – I don't put it. You, it's, it's not mysterious. You're right. It's not a mystique. It's not a sort of weird thing. It, it's basically taking what we do already – and kind of improving it and formalizing a bit. So I'll give you one example. So one of the things we teach at the Center for Space Management as well is critical appraisal. Now, that's a fancy word for basically saying, how trustworthy is this information? And you, we use the example of TripAdvisor before. So, so one of the exercises we do with students, or I do with students, is to say, okay, here's TripAdvisor. Do you trust it? And depending on the age of the student and how many times they've been able to go to restaurants, they have different kind of views about it. So you say, okay, supposing I told you that actually anyone can put reviews up here. What do you think now? What, you don't have to have gone there? No. Anyone <laughs> can put, oh, okay. So maybe, oh, maybe they don't believe as much. And then the example we gave before. Supposing I now tell you that you can pay people to put reviews up. How do you feel about it now? Oh, yeah, I'm not, oh, okay, I'm a bit less sure now. So what you're trying to introduce are the general principles of how reliable, trustworthy the data are. So for example, where did they collect them? Why were they collected? What kind of biases? Could there be what didn't what informational data didn't they collect? Those kind of basic ways of thinking about can I trust or believe this point of you know, this kind of evidence? And for example, yeah, with what's going on politically in the world in, in many countries, there's an interesting issue there about whether in general we all need a bit more training and skills in actually sort of identifying, in a sense, what some people like to call fake news, for example. So these yeah. are sort of core skills. That can be some of these can be taught in school. So, so that's one of the things we do. One of these critical appraisal. The other thing we spend a lot of time doing is actually also thinking about cognitive biases. 
Now, this is a very, very important, uh, I guess, part of thinking about why a barrier to evidence-based practice and also be, becoming more aware of it and how we can overcome it. Now, clearly, evidence-based practice requires a lot of thinking and it requires processing of information and gathering information. And one of the things that can really mess this up is our cognitive biases. And broadly speaking, uh, we have found that even quite senior decision makers often have never even heard of a cognitive bias. Mm. Like they don't even know what that is. And so it's quite extraordinary if you think about it, that people being paid a lot of money to use their cognitive processes to make very important decisions are not aware of some of the limitations and some of the, the ways they could be biased and that might go wrong. So, you know, we present people with bits of information. We talk about Kahneman and Tversky, those kind of things. As a way of making sense, it's not about feeling stupid. It's about saying we are easily fooled. We're easily fooled. And it's not a big deal. But it, if you're not aware of it, then, again, that's something else can get in the way. So that, and again, they're just two examples of the critical appraisal and cognitive biases. They're just a way in which we build up a sort of sense of what are the skills you need, being aware of this kind of thing. How do you collect information? How do you kind of start to analyze it? How do you pull it together? How do you prioritize better quality stuff back to judging, you know, critical appraisal and judging its quality and actually doing it in quite sort of small steps? And if it's not students, if it's people in organizations, one of the things, there's two things we sometimes suggest is one is they do, and this is quite an interesting activity, people do an audit of a decision that they took a while ago. So imagine a manager manager introduced some new thing, a new practice or policy a year ago. Uh, and then you say, can you remember who was in the room? How did you decide to do that? And then you say, okay, let's look over these four sources of evidence. To what extent did you look at your professional expertise in a conscientious, explicit, and judicious way? Did you look at organizational data? What was it telling you? Did you look at scientific evidence? Did you talk at stakeholders? And that, that kind of example usually shows pretty clearly, yes, people made a decision. It may have been a great decision, a poor decision, but they didn't really go through much of a process. They didn't look at multiple sources. They didn't think about the quality of data. So that's what another example of the kind of thing you do to stop. Again, it's not to make people feel bad or stupid. It's to say, this is the decision you made. You could probably make future decisions in a slightly more effective way. You know, So you're not trying to make massive claims. You're not trying to say this is weird stuff that only, that only super clever people can do. It's not the point of it. It's really not the point of it. Yeah, so that's kind of a few examples. Yeah. It's a skill like riding a bicycle. Yes. If you're like, oh no, it is. <clears throat> I don't do this currently. Yeah. Well, great. Look, you can go to the Center for Evidence Based yes, Management, exactly. learn how to do yeah. it. And then that's not a problem anymore. It's like, you know, you, you've got the skill and yeah. you can do it. And then you're now functioning at this higher plane. And now this is the second part that once we get to that higher plane, it's, we're going to be proving management truths right <laughs> right yes well yeah this is the tricky thing this is a, this is can be a great source of disappointment to people so often one of the things i often say in my, my sort of teaching in training is that one of the misconceptions about evidence-based practice is it's about fi proving things and finding the truth and i think again personally for me and, I think and truth that, means you're always going to have a good outcome Yes. The, the yes. truth is never, no matter what we decide, we're yes. going bankrupt next month. The truth is good. <laughs> it's always good. Yeah, quite, quite. Uh, so I, I think I was guilty of like, thinking like, many, many years ago, I guess we were not much experience or whatever, of feeling, yes, it is all about proof and truth. And I think there's a whole range of problems that one is that proof and truth, certainly proof, is something you don't find, as it were, in the real world. You find it in maths, algebra, logic. Truth isn't out there in the world. Now, by saying this, I'm not being, you know, super postmodern and there is no truth. I just mean we're not searching for the truth. We're looking for probabilities and likelihoods. Uh, and secondly, the other thing about proof is, is again, proof is just is a mathematical thing. It's not a kind you can't. Science doesn't prove stuff. Data doesn't prove stuff. Again, it just gives you indications of what's more likely to be the case. And that kind of probabilistic way of thinking, again, Chris, to your point, it is it is one of the skills, but it's very difficult, as you know, for human beings to think probabilistically. It's incredibly difficult. Yeah. Why they want to know, is that right or is it wrong? Is it true? Is it false? And while there are some things like that, most of the things we deal with, as, as certainly as managers, as decision makers, as practitioners, they're not really like that. So accepting it's about probability is quite a sort of tricky one. Uh, but again, there are techniques you can use to help you do that. In particular, I think doing with a group of people 
you can do things like, well, let, what odds would you put on this? Have a guess. How, how strongly do you, do you think that's the case? And look, start thinking in those terms rather than, is it right or is it wrong? Yeah. So, yeah, and, th I, and that's another really hard thing. And I even see this bias in academia when, sure. people, you know, when people are talking about, well, this study shows. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. It, yeah. it shows that that study showed something. That's yeah. about it. Absolutely. But I, I printed it out from Google <laughs> Scholar. I, <know. laughs> I think I think there's, there's certain to be red flags either when people are talking or writing. And yeah, and, and the studies show, science mm -hmm. shows, we know from science, all these are indications. The person writing or speaking sort of doesn't really understand science, but they're trying to make a rhetorical sort of piece of certainty around it. And I think, and yeah, that it, and it is, it is. Uh, it is difficult. And the other thing is that I think about, say, things are true and false, is it dichotomizes everything right. into one category or the other. Uh, and that's okay, but most things aren't like that. And similarly, back to science in, say, IO psychology, statistical significance testing is a great example. And p-hacking, mm -hmm. you know, if it's if it's below 0 0.005, that is real. And if it's not, if it's slightly above that, then it, it's false. It's nuts. You draw <laughs> a line and say if the result is just there, it's important. So it's just the other side. It's not important. I'll have to it's, manipulate it's my nuts. data in another way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I have to do it to get that p value to find a, some significance. So right, it, it absolutely does happen in academia as well. And broadly speaking, I think it's just because people we are not generally very good at thinking probabilistically, and it is right. it is extremely difficult. We want some sort of sense of certainty, whether it's true or false. We want a sort of sense of certainty. So back to your point, Chris, training thinking about how we can develop people being more comfortable with doubt. Mm -hmm. And going back to your point, Ben, about cultures and climates, the idea that a leader has doubt is something, you know, a leader's not supposed to say, oh, I don't know, I'm not too sure. They're not supposed to say, on the whole, stuff like that. But that's that kind of idea of, of feeling doubtful, not being sure, is, again, is, is really key, I think, in evidence-based practice. Yeah, yeah it, kind of, it kind of reminds me of, uh, I think Carl Weick said it, that uh, you, know, you should argue as if you're right, but listen as if yes, you're wrong. exactly, I, I, yeah. I, I love that idea. Yeah, so, yeah. You but know, the, what, the incentives here are horrible. They imagine, are. Imagine your Q10 earnings release, you're yeah. talking with the analysts, and you're like, well, our strategy for this year is 70% likely to succeed. We think... There's a lot of ambiguity here, but we're hoping for the best. You yeah. Know, your share price, you know, incentives, that tanks your share price. And so yeah. it's like, we feel confident in the direction we go. We're going to defeat our enemies and rejoice in the lamentations of their women out in the marketplace. Yeah. You know, full Conan here. And <laughs> that, but, and here's the thing though, this, so we're talking about biases. When something's not a hundred percent true, then people can use that to su shut down the broader dialogue yes, exactly. that would help your, oh, well, science misses it all the time. Well, what are you mm. going to do? When you get cancer, are you not going to go see a doctor, you numbskull? No. Now, they may not know every single thing about your body and all that kind of thing, but they're going to do their best to wield what intellectual and observational tools that they have to help you out. Yeah, but it, but in organizations, it's well. This isn't one hundred percent. We're not going to do it. I, yeah. I don't know. I thought eighty five percent was good odds. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, again, it's about the issue about saying we think this is more likely to work. But again, it's quite hard for leaders and decision makers to say let's do this because I think it's probably on the balance of probabilities more likely to work than not. But that's exactly the kind of language and thinking that actually is quite important for evidence based practice. Because you're right. As soon as you start saying, "I'm only going to do this if I'm one hundred percent sure." or at least say I'm 100% sure, then it really narrows the possibilities of what you can do. It also means you can never properly evaluate anything because you're terrified to look back because you claimed it was definitely going to work. And of course, if you're going to claim it's definitely going to work, you're not going to want to find out if it has because probably it hasn't because most things don't work or they don't work 100%. So you're kind of guaranteed to fail, so you're not going to want to find out. But yeah, the incentives are pretty pretty tricky as well. And I think linked to that also, I think, is the... If you're back to your, the point about learning and development, this this to me is something that I think if you're going to see it in a team or an organisation. You'd see this, I think, is developing over quite a long period of time. So I think back to practice, you do it for one decision. Then you think about the next thing. Then you think about the next thing. And maybe you know, a year later, you've done it for four or five pretty important decisions. And you're probably going to get better at it. Give it another 18 months. Give it two years. It's going to become much more just routine 
as a way you've done things. At first, it's going to be a bit alien, but I think over time, it's going to make a lot of sense. And also, I think one of the key things is also how we learn. Something uh, I hear, well, I hear a lot, is that people are making decisions so fast and they're moving on from one thing to the next thing to the next thing. They don't really know why they made the decision. They don't really know if that decision worked. You know, the chances of learning, apart from politically learning how to manage your career <laughs> in those contexts, is about zero because you're just not getting you're not getting information about what the problem is. You're not getting information about what to do. You're not getting information about did it work or not. And so in a sense, you're in a context where it's really difficult to learn. I think, and that to me is one of the reasons why, at least in some organisations, in my view, often very senior leaders uh, they got there because of things like charisma, or they got there because they're great at working with people. They got there because they're good at making stuff happen. They got there because they're kind of inspirational. They didn't get there because they're actually really good at thinking through evidence and data and problems and issues. And I think, again, going back to Ben's point about climate, cultural leadership, this, this is also a challenge. Because, again, uh, for a leader, it could be somebody very, very junior to them actually has a much better understanding of what's going on by following this approach, which can be very threatening, of course, to some leaders. To others, I think they'd welcome it. But for some leaders, this is pretty it's threatening stuff because... It's not what they're into. It's not how they got there. Yeah. And it's also potentially undermining. Yeah, you know, one other pitfall that I just want to touch mm. on here, or one idea is the role of experts. And I'm using, yes. you know, quotation marks. Right. And, yeah. um, you know, there are people who certainly do know a lot about sure. certain things. And I, I wonder if sometimes people take this idea of evidence-based practice and say, oh, well, we're, we're just going to ask the experts on this. Yeah. Yeah. Now, this is very interesting. So uh, about every six months, I... Uh, go on LinkedIn and Twitter, and I put I show the, the infographic, which will be on the, the, the show notes, the infographic showing four sources of evidence, six steps, conscientious, explicit, judicious. And I say, look, is anyone out there doing this? I don't mean perfectly, but is anyone out there doing some of this? And um, people rarely get back, but when they do, they might they say, yeah, we're doing this in my company. I go, okay, are you sure you're doing that? I go, yeah, absolutely. I say, okay. Can we talk? Yeah. And most times it turns out they're not doing it or they're doing it a tiny, tiny bit. But exactly to your point, Ben, one of the ways they say they're doing it, I say, so what scientific evidence did you gather? What did you they say? Oh, well, we went to talk to Professor So-and-so at Harvard. And I'm going, oh, no, that isn't the point. The point is not to ask Professor So-and-so. The point is to look at the scientific evidence. Not because that person isn't an expert, but like all experts, almost by definition, they're biased towards their thing, their field. Their areas. So I think experts are not good sources of evidence. I think experts are good sources of expertise in helping you understand that evidence or interpreting it. But in medicine and other fields that do systematic reviews of scientific evidence, one of the key things is you actually get people to do it who have no vested interests. So you're not interested in what the experts think, you're interested in what the evidence shows. And that's and that's a big there's a big distinction to be made there. So I think it's great to ask experts. But bear in mind, they're, they're good sources, I guess, of opinions, of interpretations, but they're not in themselves great sources of evidence. Yeah. So there, there's a logical fallacy that I want to label here, mm. which is appeal to authority. Yeah. I talk sure. to an authority. Listen, yeah. guys, something is true, not because somebody says yeah. it's true, but because a preponderance of evidence shows it to be true. And so I always hate it when I'm in these, you know, so I live in Park City. There's a lot of like former CEOs and stuff here. If we have a stupid parent teacher conference, they stand up as the CEO, right. as a neurobiologist. I'm like, dude, you're a neurobiologist. What do you know about pedagogy for K through 12? Yeah. Nothing. <laughs> yeah. And, and so it's like, okay, that's nice that you have a title or were a numbskull in your previous life. So what, what are we talking about here? And and I think any scientist, because I watch this as because I'm not a scientist. I just read you guys a lot. Uh, <laughs> ben is a scientist. You're a scientist. Um, you research this kind of stuff. And I I just have to go with some of this stuff. You know, you read this, the studies. I just have to ask you, well, how help me understand how this yeah. is true. But the, the challenge is I observe different behavioral paradigms with scientists when they're talking to me oh i'm mr scientist i know what's up listen to me i'm the smart guy but the minute i see a scientist in the room with another scientist especially somebody in the field i.e somebody that can call baloney 
everything starts to get caveated like crazy. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> well, in this context, well, and this guy provides his countervening opinion. And and so this is as a lay person that isn't a scientist that is addressing science. Yes. Yeah, you can yeah. just say, hey, man, I believe you. I think you're the smartest thing yeah. since sliced bread. But help me understand the evidence rather than help me understand that I should just go with whatever somebody that has PhD element, you know, like a the long, yeah. you know, Lord of Wales, Prince of whatever, besides his name. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as as I'm over fond of saying, it depends is usually the right answer to any question. It depends. But then it's our job to work out what it depends on. And you're right. I think when scientists and experts are talking to each other and they can be called out or, or people know what they're talking about, they 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 tend to caveat, say it depends, well, maybe much more. If they're not if they're talking to someone else, they're kind of like, oh no, we know this from science, but it's pretty clear this is the case, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a real issue there about what role experts play in this, because clearly, you know, having expertise is very important, of course, but it also has its problems too. And that's something I think experts find it quite difficult to, some anyway, to kind of accept. That kind of it depends, and the other thing that goes along with this, of course, is the the single scientific study problem. So people uh, often will, again, practitioners as well. So I read half a business review, and there's this study, and it shows this. So let's do that. And again, from an evidence based practice perspective, you keep, you want to sort of scream at them: a single study does not matter. A single study does not matter. Forget it. It just doesn't matter, because like in any of these sources of evidence, it's a body of evidence that's important. So, you know, you want, in an organizational context, you wouldn't just talk to one stakeholder. That would make kind of no sense. You look across a range of stakeholders. You want to get a, the body of evidence about that particular thing. So I think also quite often scientists overemphasize single studies uh, at the cost of looking at what the whole body of research says, which may be very different, may be very yeah. different to what a single study says. Yeah. yeah. So, Rob, this has just been a phenomenal conversation, and I think this area of evidence-based practice is so important, not only in management, but across other areas mm. of life and society. I just want to ask you, though, you know, are there any other things that interest you or things you're working on that you'd like to share with our listeners? Well, uh, I've, been, <laughs> I've been fairly obsessed with this for a long time. Uh, <laughs> but, what, but, but in relation to this, what I have to say, what I've become more and more interested in is in in how about, how about it? I think one of the reasons this stuff happens is just because we're human and we're in human organizations. So I think there's one way in which you can say, oh, my God, wasn't that a stupid decision? Why did they do that? As though it's abnormal. But it's not abnormal. It's normal. It's, it's what we, we kind of do. And I think one of the challenges for me, and I've been thinking about this a lot, about, for example, our personal lives and our family lives and our home lives, all kinds of stuff. The way we make decisions in these contexts, we often transfer into the workplace. So one example right. is, is like consumer goods. Um, um, again, my go-to example of this is, have you ever come across a thing called a banana guard? A no, banana that, guard? What? what? <laughs> no. Yeah, no. okay. I'm sure you have, it maybe caused, you may see, so basically it's a plastic case, which, which hinges in the middle, in which you can put a banana to put in your bag. Have you ever okay. seen these? <laughs> Maybe not. Maybe no, they do okay. exist. I don't know. They, that's brilliant. Though. Okay, that's brilliant. Okay, we'll put it in the show notes. A link to Amazon <laughs> with the banana guy. <laughs> Love it. So, uh, but another example might be again. I use this a lot when I'm teaching and training. Another example might be something like a food processor or a juicer. Now, you, you typically say to a group of people in the context I teach, "How many of you have ever bought a juicer?" And it's like fifty or sixty percent. How many of you used it for longer than a week? Or a month, and it's kind of hardly anybody. <laughs> or how many of you bought a bread maker, a food processor, or whatever it is? So, so there's a tendency in which we want stuff to do stuff, like buying this juicer, because we, we think somehow we've got a problem with not enough juice. <laughs> we've got an opportunity to enhance our juice consumption, or whatever it is, or <laughs> we're not healthy enough. So we don't haven't defined the problem or opportunity, and then we bought this thing as a solution to a non-defined problem. And then we end up just not using it. And to me, that's a sort of nice kind of metaphor for the, 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 the again, my feelings about talking to more and more people about this is why people find this so hard is because we take in the way in which we make decisions in everyday life into the workplace to make really big and important decisions. And we don't see the difference. 
Yeah. It's a bit, it's the same sort of, we need a juice, so let's just Google. We need a supplier who's going to supply this training. Do we need it? I don't know. Let's just get a trainer, pay for it, job done. Now, maybe that training is good. It may, the chances are it's completely pointless, like the juicer for most people. But I've got come quite interested why we don't. It's hard, as I think, professionals and practitioners to sort of get that everyday decision-making. That's kind of fine. I mean, you can argue about this. Is it bad there are millions and millions of unused juicers in the world? Yeah, it's not very good for the planet, but it does create some employment. So, but you could argue overall, the effect is not kind of great, right? So you could argue that. So I think it. So it, it's not as bad. But if you're a CEO, if you're a senior decision maker, and you're you're sort of approaching these decisions, or you and your team are in the same sort of way, then you know, potentially that's going to be, or politician is, or policymakers are, that's going to be quite problematic. So I become back to your question, Ben. What are, I've got more and more interest in. in, in why, how we take these things that make us human and everyday stuff into workplaces, into other contexts, and how they, they're probably fine for some things, but for certain categories and types of decisions, they're, they're the kind of absolute opposite of what, what we want to be doing. So yeah. that, that's become quite a big that's, interest. That's fascinating and great. So Rob, are there any places on the web where people can go to learn more about you? Sure. I, I, uh, so I've got, uh, like, like many people's, web, I have a website which needs serious uh, updating, uh, but that's www.robbreenerone.com. There's also the Centre for Evidence-Based Management, which is www.sebma.org. But again, I'll give you the links to those. Uh, yeah, they're, they're the kind of main sources. I've also got a YouTube channel, which I created just to put some of the presentations I've done in the last few years together. Yeah, and, and if anyone's interested, has questions, wants to argue with me, that'd be great. I'd be very happy to do that. Uh, but yeah, there's, and there's more and more stuff around now, I think, about evidence-based, perhaps evidence-based management. And I'd urge people to take a look at it. But I'd also, as I think both you know you and Chris have been saying, is to sort of think of it as a skill. Don't get too carried away. It's not a thing given from God, or whatever, that's going to solve every problem. It's just a way of thinking and practicing about how to make better informed decisions, which is very important, but we don't have to make a massive deal about it. But it is difficult, but it is something you can learn. Yeah. So a lot of you guys out here, if you feel uncontrolled, you know, there's lack of control in your life and in your workspace. And if your way of making decisions has been a monkey see, monkey do of whoever you've been around, and you'd like to get some more control around this through an easy to understand framework that you could just start baking in bit by bit into your day to day, check out the Center for Evidence-Based Management, check out Rob Breener's stuff on the internet. We, we are delighted to amplify his voice and, and you guys should do it too. So if you love this episode, Share it with your management, share it with your friends, put it out on Twitter. Rob's on Twitter. Um, we'll put his handle in the show notes. But I mean, it's just, it's something so easy to do. And bit by bit, you can take control of your life and make better decisions. Not perfect decisions, not mm -hmm. decisions that arrive at 100% truth, because that's not the world we live in, guys, but better decision to increase your chances at success. That's right. So, Rob Breener, it has just been an absolute pleasure having you here on the Indigo Podcast. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure and some great questions. I really enjoyed the discussion, and I hope it's uh, shed a bit more light on this, this topic. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Indigo Podcast. If you like this podcast, please consider helping us by rating us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen, telling your friends about us, having us on your podcast, or mentioning us on social media. Our website is www.indigopodcast.com, where you can access more information about us and this episode. Thanks again, and we look forward to talking with you again soon.